There's so much going on in the global commodity markets right now. There's so many moving pieces and information is changing daily. We're seeing extreme price volatility across the commodities and global trade flows and patterns have been changing, which has created a really challenging environment. So it's certainly not just in oil and energy, but we're seeing it in all the commodities with big moves in commodity prices. Certainly front of mind is Russia and Ukraine, which are key producers of a lot of the commodities and suppliers of feedstock for areas of commodity production. So the impact from the invasion and then the sanctions has been really widely felt. Russia accounts for around 10% of global oil production, and they're about 40% of global potash production. And they're critical in a number of other commodities as well, such as nickel, copper, palladium, and coal. And it's not just supply that's driving commodity prices. It's really hard to readjust global trade flows for commodities on supply disruptions. The winners are the commodity producers outside of Eastern Europe who take advantage of the higher prices. The winners are also the buyers who will ignore the sanctions. Clearly, the losers are the producers in Eastern Europe and those that use Russia and Ukraine inputs in their manufacturing process. The losers are also us, the consumers, with inflation. Commodities are at the front end of the supply chain, and higher prices for materials like energy, metal, and fertilizers drives inflation down to us. So with that background in mind, we'll give a couple of updates on the key commodities. First on oil, so we've seen the impact in our wallets at the pump. Russia supplies around 10% of the global market. We've seen the price move from the low 90s in February to about $105 a barrel now. It's a lot of signposts in the energy sector that we're watching for. First and foremost, Russia and Ukraine outcomes, how OPEC supply response reacts to the market, and if there's potential for an Iran deal. We're watching the North American supply response to high prices really closely. And on the demand side, we're watching for COVID in China and how the impact on demand from the zero COVID policy plays out. Starting with Russia and Ukraine, our base case is that the sanctions likely stay for longer, even if the war ends tomorrow. We don't think things go back to normal in the near term. So what does that mean? In our view, it means that global trade flows will have to be rebalanced and that'll take time and it'll create dislocated markets and arbitrage opportunities in energy. On the OPEC side, they've been sticking to the script of plus 400,000 barrels a day of monthly increases. And the key question is, is, will that continue? We're seeing compliance from OPEC at plus 100%, which to us doesn't imply necessarily that their behavior is good, but that they probably have limited ability to grow. And plus Biden has midterm elections later this year and may not want to look weak on Iran by doing a deal. Probably the area where we have the most visibility is on the North American supply response. At the end of the day, if we step back from all the politics, our view is that the oil market is fundamentally tight. We think the price of oil can be supported over the next couple of months. The real wild card that we're watching for is COVID growth in China and the impact that that has on global demand. Next, turning to copper, we're seeing unseasonably low inventory levels into the spring, and that's supportive for the next few months. On the supply side, there are a couple of large-scale new projects coming and ramping up now, but there isn't much in the pipeline for development after that. On the demand side, China's in a period of fiscal and monetary loosening, and copper prices are already at elevated levels. Typically, when China eases, that's associated with growing demand for copper. So with inventories low and limited supply growth, we think that that Chinese easing can be supportive for the price. Again, like with energy, the risk on the demand side is the zero COVID policy in China. And then over the medium term, we think there's a structural bull case for copper to be made. With the transition to a lower carbon energy market, that'll be hugely copper intensive, both on the front end, but also on the power grid upgrades that'll be required to deliver the green energy to end consumers. So given this new source of copper demand, we expect that new mines will have to be incentivized into production to balance the market. And that should come at a much higher copper price to stimulate exploration and bring the next generations of projects into production. <music>